Welcome back to UAP Studies Podcast. This is an episode that I've been looking forward to for quite some time. Uh, Michael, I know you are meeting actually Richard and Tracy for the first time. This is the first yep. time I actually had uh, a conversation live with Tracy. We uh, talk on Facebook every once in a while, but I've never got to talk to her in person. So it's awesome to have the uh, Dolans here today. Uh, how you doing, Michael? I'm doing great. I'm really excited because I've been in this topic for about four years now, and I'm finally getting to see some of the like very first faces that I saw say anything in like a UAP documentary. And I thought, oh, that makes sense. That's a thoughtful uh, sort of uh, knowledgeable perspective that you're bringing. And uh, Richard Dolan is definitely one of those people. So it's an honor to have him on the podcast. Thanks. Thanks very much, guys. And we're both happy to be here doing this together. Uh, yeah. This is, an, this is not an everyday occurrence. No, it's pretty oh, rare, really? actually. Oh, yeah. really? I would assume that people would want the married couple that do this work together to be on together. That's that's weird. Well, maybe maybe there'll be more in the future. But no, we just did one together with uh, 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 Alexis Brooks, who's a good friend of ours, a few weeks ago. That might have been the first. So this might be the second that yeah, we've done as guests. Since we well, had our show together. Yeah, it's been a while. Well, well we're mm -hmm. honored. We're honored. Um, we like it too. I mean, it's fun. It's, but, you know, yeah. We're kind of the, into slightly different things, but it all overlaps. And uh, yeah. Yeah. it's fun. And opposites attract. That's a thing too. I, I think, you you know, as a married couple, if you're open to ideas and subjects and, and good conversations, which obviously you guys are both great conversationalists, you have nothing to run out to talk about you could always Never. talk about the house plant behind you if you want to and that's not a problem um <laughs> for but, us i would say it's like compliments attract i mean not quite opposites but we uh we do compliment each other very nicely uh tracy brings things to the table that i don't do and uh and vice versa and so we we feel like we really fill the gaps mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so the conversation that too. the overlap and 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 differences in your interests like how would you characterize them tracy and and richard our differences, how and yeah, overlaps and, and overlaps and interests, yeah. Oh well, you know, um, when I met Richard, I was already deep into all of this. You know, I was already, I had probably come more from, uh, just a lot of phenomena was entering my world growing up and I did not understand what was going on to me. So I'm kind of coming from more of a, an experientialist side where I wasn't thinking uh, for years about ET, UFO, things like that. Mm -hmm. That whole area scared me, you know, mm -hmm. but um, I was trying to work out what was happening because the reality that had been explained to me and reinforced through degrees and everything uh, was not what and my experience had a total conflict, you know, so I was on this mission to try to figure out, first of all, am I okay? You know, um, part of the reason for my psych degree, you know, I wanted to study the mind and, and know its reaches and where I stood within that. And I wanted to make sure, honestly, that, um, that uh, I was psychologically grounded and stable, um, because of all these things that were happening. So yes, for me, it's very uh, coming from the experiential side. Then it sort of ventured more into uh, some experiences that I had that opened the ET UFO door. And um, that's what got you to UFO conferences, which is where we met. Which is where we met. That's right. Meant to be. So, meant yeah. To be. Yeah. So, but yeah. the answer, like, we do have a lot of overlap. Uh, we're both interested in, um, well, Tr Tracy's gotten very uh, conversant with UFOs in general, abduction phenomena. She did a whole independent study of that, interviewed many, many uh, witness, uh, abductees. Um, we talk about AI, future tech all the time. Mm -hmm. Tracy does a lot of that, and I am interested. So there's a lot. And then we have different focuses. I mean, Tracy is more focused on consciousness issues, but but not to the exclusion of me. Like, I'm interested mm -hmm. in that as well, frankly. We just did an event last weekend, which was all about consciousness, and I loved being part of that. Um, but then, you know, I, I will focus more on just not, not only UFOs, but geopolitics, international politics, history. But I find, you know, my wife has, this wasn't her interest in the beginning of our time together, but I will have to say she's come a long way. So we overlap in a lot of ways. And I think at the uh, bottom of it, we're both insatiable for knowledge and um, that- Probably like your listeners. Yeah. And you guys, of course, yeah. it just propels you forward and we're always curious. And of course, these areas are not exclusive. 
they of course they overlap yeah. completely yeah. right and uh I think the more you find out about any one of them the more you see that there's sort of causal and interesting uh, thematic connections between them so that's i'm sure that's a fertile ground for conversation and relationships that's and looking, also to work together that's looking at like a web and yeah. uh, the more you yeah. learn the more everything's interconnected we've got the best early morning coffee cup conversations <laughs> we could imagine <laughs> we should record them more because they're pretty good we well actually we that was a big part of our member site in the beginning we would have coffee talk and we would actually be sitting there in our robes having that's our a coffee. good idea that's and i just thought i gotta record this guy I gotta, I gotta capture these rants. I originally wanted to call them Richard's rants. <laughs> I, I just rant thought these are gold. People yeah. would love to hear this because he's just unfiltered, you know. So that's kind Richard's of Richard's nuggets. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. I but think yeah, I've, that's yeah. I have the best conversations with my wife in the bathroom. I don't know why. <laughs> Uh, she'll always come in. Yeah, she'll come in and ask me like, "Hey, what do you think of this?" Like, oh, we'll get a big debate. It's like twenty minutes go by. We're still in the bathroom arguing over some stupid. Uh, but it's you know, but that's the thing. Um, I always tell people too: you have to focus uh, in this field. You have to focus on specific things. Uh, mm -hmm. Michael is more on the ph philosophy side of things. Like, what is the involvement of disclosure? What does that mean? Um, you know, and we need philosophy in this. Yes, mm -hmm. we do. As much yeah. as we need science, it's if not more, because uh, it reshapes our thinking, our understanding of our place in the universe. What is the universe? I mean, we wouldn't have science if we didn't have philosophy to begin with. Uh, so it's important. And I think that's that's the point we're trying to push across is uh, this is why Michael is such uh, uh, an instrumental part of, of the podcast. Because My influence is seeping in. I can tell. I'm glad to. I'm glad yeah, to hear it. Yeah. Am I doing it right? Am I reading it the way you wanted me to read yeah, it? The yeah, the cue okay. cards are you're, okay. you're following them perfectly. <laughs> the script, no, perfect. It's, yeah. it's good. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of different disciplines that are sort of uh, people are just gently waking up to the idea that they not only have an interest in this, but also there's uh, room for them to actually say something. I mean, I think Richard, you were a Cold War historian at first. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yep. Yeah. Was, so um, studied a lot of philosophy, by the way. Very oh, nice, nice, nice. Very strong interest of mine. Yes, that always has been. Um, as an undergraduate, I was a maniac. I was for a little while. I was officially a declared triple major, triple oh, uh, English lit, history, and philosophy were my three. And I uh, eventually, I thought, all right, the philosophy is too much. So I ended up getting a minor in philosophy, but I did get a dual major in uh, English lit and history. So I've always loved philosophy. Always. What were the um, interests? I mean, the were they sort of. Yeah, political philosophy. I mean, I know politics is an interest. Uh, I it was kind of, I went into a very unstructured. So I was 18 years old and discovered Frederick sure. Nietzsche. Oh yeah, he's the, just the person who he, I used to have a my, portrait on him on my desk. Yeah, Nietzsche's like a strong drink, and you better be able to handle it because he's a genius. Um, he's someone that I've come back to many, many times over the years. But uh, no, I got into. Um, Really, the whole tradition of Western uh, philosophy. I studied a lot of Immanuel Kant, believe it or not, and uh, uh, all the way through from uh, you know uh, Aquinas through Descartes and uh, um, yeah, so like a broad history uh, of philosophy, sort of. I mean, which and, makes and, sense. Human, and, yeah, and, and all, yeah, absolutely. So, like the good kind of colloquium sort of uh, study. Yeah. Uh, but then from there, I moved into for a while. I wanted to be what was called an intellectual historian. So this essentially yeah. the history of ideas. Um, so let's leave it there. And um, I got into what's called historiography, which is the study of history as a discipline. Did all of that. And then um, did a lot of European uh, history, German, did a lot of German history, uh, and then fell into Cold War studies. So by the time I was in my late 20s, early 30s, I was really studying U.S. Cold War history. And it was from there that I discovered the UFO subject. Uh, I've talked about it a number of times. But yeah, uh, 30, a little more than 30 years ago, my career goal, uh, nice, delicious, beautiful black hair, uh, big round glasses and a big <laughs> smile. And I believed in the future. And I was going to teach uh, history at a university. That was my goal. And it was going to be Cold War history. I was all about Harry Truman, 1950, outbreak of war in Korea, US national security uh, strategy and so forth. Uh, and from there, I I'm so glad you failed in that dream. Me too. It was uh, it was weird. Uh, told us sometime. I don't want to get uh, belabor this, but I was in a bookstore in the very early 90s. It was um, 
kind of a new age bookstore and it had a, a UFO book on the shelf. It was by the great Timothy Good, whose uh, classic book mm -hmm. Above Top Secret was staring right at me. Uh, but it was his subtitle that got my attention, The Worldwide UFO Cover-Up. And uh, I remember flipping through it thinking, this is a pretty good book. Looks pretty good. Uh, he's got documents in there. And uh, the thing that was weird for me was that uh, Tim was writing about all of these departments and people that I had studied in my academic work. I recognized yeah. many of the names and I thought, wait, he's got them with flying saucers. Why have I not read about any of this in my academic work? Is this all BS or is there something here? Really simple. And I bought the book and I got on what was then the internet at the time. News news bulletin boards, you know, people oh, yeah, news boards. But there was a lot yeah. of UFO information there. And I the next thing I knew, it was a, a rabbit hole and I be I totally became obsessed. Uh, yeah, my, my, well go ahead, Jason. I was gonna say still to this day, Richard, you hold the title for the best hair in ufology. You know what I mean? Like your hair was, <laughs> was best was hair, renowned. best hair, wow, best hair in ufology. You know, I decided not to compete. I'm going for the mustache instead. Yeah, you get the mustache oh. award at the yeah. yeah. Uh, contact All right, you got that, you got you something uh, different. Yeah, <laughs> look, man, I thank you, but this is not the best hair. It's probably like the third or fourth best. I know, but it's like the, every time I, there's got to be a couple of people out. There. He's got some good He's brows. You gotta say yeah well but like i said <laughs> oh, you, the eyebrows yeah there we go the eyebrows yeah you do yeah it's, yeah it's a big feature right yeah now, yeah now that stanton's gone i'll take the eyebrow we, we have to be distinct we have to all have our own looks right be recognizable hi nick was re recognizable so we're all trying to keep yeah, up yeah, yeah. Totally. Yeah, they're great brows yeah i'm gonna grow brows. like a massive mullet i think that's gonna be my look <laughs> that would stand out now that you would stand out like right um, yeah, among yeah. the among the people Wait. at conferences i think it would but on on message boards and forums i think that there's somebody there's a lot of mullets that are, are just you have no no chance of competing with <laughs> well but th this this actually leads me to a, a thought so both of you are, are very intellectual people right um, and we're seeing a lot more intellects getting into the subject. Um, you know, scientists like Gary Nolan is coming forward, sure. and he's yeah. really dishing it out too. Like he told yeah. he told Tyson DeGrasse, whatever his name is, I don't care. Oh yeah, um, he told him off, right? Um, he did and, yes. And the it's about event. time. Right. It's about time. Uh, totally. You know, saying that hey, there's so much evidence here that you're throwing out the window because your ego. You know, uh, I'm I'm the go-to guy for science, and he brought up a good point hasn't written any papers, hasn't done any science, uh, you know, studies or anything like nothing of value. He just goes on shows and poo poos on everybody else's research. He also put, uh, uh, basically took a, a statement that I believe originally was from Bertrand Russell. There's a great philosopher. Uh, Russell once said, um, this is a paraphrase, but he said a scientist who's engaged in uh, who uses his scientific expertise for anything other than an objective, dispassionate search for the truth is engaging in a kind of intellectual treason uh, mm -hmm. or something to that effect. That was Birch and Russell. And that's really what Gary Nolan said about Neil deGrasse mm -hmm. Tyson. He really, he essentially stated, look, you're using your position as this very powerful spokesperson for the world of science, but you're not using it in, in uh, a scientific manner at all. In fact, you're using it uh, purely as the regime spokesperson. That's really what you're doing. And that's that's intellectual treason. Uh, Gary didn't say it that way, but that's essentially what he did say. And uh, that, yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's a sort of Russell. spokesperson for scientific orthodoxy or something, right? Yeah. I mean, and maybe we need that. Maybe we need some sort of authoritative voice where people can go and say, oh, that's what scientists generally believe. But to say it as if it's um, established an undeniable truth is so problematic. And this is, this is a... A problem that I have as a philosopher, because philosophers come off inevitably as arrogant, because we 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 presume to actually know things that other people of other disciplines don't. But one of the things that I think I know about science as a philosopher is that scientists don't study science. Scientists study things like stars and the mating patterns of birds and how clouds and rocks form. You say they practice like science, maybe they practice science, but who yeah. studies? But but it leads to the bizarre consequence that scientists can do really great science, but not have a very sophisticated understanding of how science itself actually works as a historical discipline. Yeah. And there's a lot of blind spots in there. And people like Neil deGrasse Tyson have those. They don't understand, for instance, that, uh, that a lot of scientific theories operate using uh, fictional concepts like dark matter or something that have absolutely no observable reality, uh, mm -hmm. but they're kind of placeholders or something. And, and 
but they present these theories as if they're sort of established fact just as as clearly established as that like you know uh water freezes at a certain temperature or something and those just aren't the sure. same thing or or that's yeah, it's a perpetual frustration of mine as a philosopher i just want to say this too um one of the most shocking things to me in my degree <laughs> was uh, when I did take statistics and I learned more about experiments and the bell curve and how in science, it's regular practice to delete the outliers. Yes. And I yes. have never gotten over this because I felt like an outlier my whole life and every mm -hmm area and when you uh, just think of that when we're talking about astronomy or ufos or whatever the outliers <clears throat> are such an important part of the holistic look viewpoint at everything i mean i get why they do a lot of the time but gosh when we're talking about stuff like this and we're talking about reality i don't think we can afford to just delete the outliers, you know? And yeah. then I also was so surprised to see that sometimes the sample sizes are so small and that's what is representing the, you know, mm -hmm. the greater good. I mean, I walked away going, I need to read, you know, when I see studies, I need to go in and read every single thing about them because people just cherry pick whatever they want out of them. That's really good. And I, I've... I just can't let go of that. It's yeah. really, I mean, how often is it is that actually a true account of our greater reality? I don't know. Absolutely. I just um, got to throw that in. The deleting the outliers is uh, just, you know, mind that's blowing. An excellent point. I mean, and that, that happened, I guess the, the rationale behind that is often that you're assuming that if there's some very strange outlier, it must be a glitch in the data, the, something went wrong in the study, or you got right. some weird you know, by a sample or something, it's a, it's an assumption, but that assumption is basically just the assumption that the science that we know really does already represent reality as we assume it does. So anything that deviates from that just must be ignored. But the only way we get really radical scientific change is if those outliers pile up enough to the point that we can't ignore them. And then we have to have some new theory about them, but that's hard to do when like, as you're saying, a lot of the scientific orthodoxy that we have especially in psychology will be based on a study from 1976 that had 36 white kids from yale as their entire sample size and that's what's established for instance that like i don't you know whatever mm -hmm. scientific yes. orthodox belief we might have it's it's bizarre totally and the scales that they will um uh um compare things against were very shocking to me too. For example, uh, in uh, the psychology of religion, we studied mysticism and I mm. was blown away by the scales that made people fantasy prone. Mm. Um, Can you oh, talk a little bit about that? Well, if you consider astrology at all in any way, you're, you know, you're on their fantasy prone list. You know, oh, there's, I just, I was offended by by the in, the incredible bias of the scales that people were being measured against like subcategorization um, right yes right. i i was completely offended and i just thought you know maybe someday in the future i'm going to write my own scales and i'm going to sure. submit them but i need to get deeper into all these fields and understand it more but um i just it, i just really could see the narrow-mindedness and like you said not always on purpose right it's just the nature of how they have to study something they have to boil things down into one particular question so they can just answer that question but it's in it's so narrow um that it just doesn't leave room for genuine discovery like you were saying mm -hmm. um Absolutely. And there, it, there was a there was a book published, I think the year I was born, 1962. It's a classic. Philosophers know it. Thomas Kuhn, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, in which he coins yeah, the yeah. phrase paradigm in that book. Mm -hmm. And really what Kuhn said is, I mean, speaks to exactly what you're talking about. Uh, he says, how does science really uh, progress? Well, it, you have a scientific consensus, but then there's all this data that's anomalistic that doesn't quite fit into the consensus. And he's like, you know, if you have one or two of those, maybe you don't have to pay much attention to it. But when those anomalies start building up, uh, it becomes necessary to rethink your paradigm, he'd said. Mm -hmm. So his great example was to go from the physics of Isaac Newton to the physics of Einstein and relativity. 
He said, look, eventually the anomalies just build up and you had to construct something revolutionary. Mm -hmm. The structure of scientific revolutions is incorporating this anomalistic data, mm -hmm. which, as you were saying, gets weeded out. Yeah. Uh, and it, so it still goes on. In other words, what Kuhn wrote over 60 years ago, uh, scientists haven't learned from it. <laughs> they, they still practice the exact same way. They still yeah. self-censor and eliminate data that that does not agree with their paradigm. And psychology is particularly egregious in some areas, right? <clears throat> yeah, it's, um, absolutely. Really, uh, it's hard to have a holistic view of the human, of the person, of someone's psyche, if you're cutting out every single transpersonal aspect beyond the personality. So if people are experiencing lucid dreams, near-death experiences, abductions, whatever. Um, the the yeah. traditional exactly. psychology does not acknowledge that. You got to understand, we we just did a whole consciousness weekend event, which was amazing. Blew my mind. Uh, blew my mind. Tracy's way more experienced in this than me. Uh, but I'm I'm into it. People are surprised. They're like, Richard, you're supposed to be this objective historian. Yes, indeed. And I love doing history. I love being as objective as I can be, as factually based as possible. But that doesn't mean that I'm not fascinated by non-locality, by transpersonal psychology that you discussed. I'm very interested. We just talked with uh, Russell Targ and Dale Graff. Both mm -hmm. of these men are 89 years old. Both have had a full lifetime of studying psi phenomena. And I'm just going to tell you, they have gone deep into crazy mm -hmm. things like Precognition, retro causality. What? Retro causality. And so I, you know, I'm still at this point where I am trying to reconstruct my reality uh, based on some of the things that they they dropped over the weekend. <laughs> and um, but my point, I guess, and I'll just end it here, is that there is so much, in my am convinced, there's so much of our reality that we have not grasped. And so for us to just put reality into the tiny, this tiny little box that we're comfortable with is not doing us any favors in the long run, because I think, you know, that prevents us from really going into the, the, the really interesting truths that undoubtedly exist all around us. I would also Ooh. say it's not just our narrow minded or dogmatic approach to science, but the emissions as well, because obviously with the UFO phenomenon, the science behind it must be insane. Um, and there's got to be thousands of scientists that have worked for these programs at this point uh, that know probably stuff on physics and understanding of the universe that we, and I say we as a scientific community at large, have no idea that it even exists. It's not even on our radar. So the emission, um, even what CERN is up to, like, do we know everything they're up to? Like it, it, certain things get omitted. It, 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 as long as they don't mention it, it's not a lie. It just don't yeah. let you know about it. Yeah. And I think we're at that age now. We're like, look, something's not adding up. The technology that we're seeing, the technology that a lot of experiencers are experiencing is not human. We know it's not human because like I'm 42 years old. I have 42 years of experience living amongst humans. That makes me an expert, right? I know what You've we're You've done your 10,000 hours. Right? Yeah, I've done, I've done <laughs> yeah. my time. Uh I know what's possible, what's not possible, and what is something that is natural and something that's not natural. Um, I had close encounter when I was a kid, and I tell you that thing above my head was not natural. It wasn't human. Mm -hmm. And that clicks in. There's like a synchronicity between what happens within and then what's happening outside that clicks in. And you're like, there's something not adding up. Yeah. Not, and the people not telling us this, it's a crime against humanity because- we should know. I have every right to know what reality is. Well, but there's case, any yeah. case in point. So last summer, I think it was last summer, David Grush talking to Congress. Was it when he said that that oh no, that he said this in a private meeting in New York City that leaked out a couple of months ago. David Grush. And he talked about the fact that we have a craft mm. that is uh 40 feet diameter on the outside, but when you go in, it's like a football field. Now, now we've heard this many times. Mm -hmm. This is not new. Um, Tracy and I have just recently been reviewing another source where this is alleged and uh, it's very interesting, but there's quite a bit. Now, if that's true, which I think there's good reason to at least entertain this as, as true, that this speaks to the question of like how strange 
the, the physics are, how strange this phenomenon is. There's a, uh, Clearly, you get these indications of space-time manipulation in one way or another. Space and time manipulation, both. Uh, so this is this phenomenon represents a physical and physics reality that's going to be that's a real challenge for us. And I'm not saying that's a good reason to keep it secret, by the way, but I I would probably imagine it is definitely something that would cause some hesitancy among those who know. Sure. I agree with that. Just, mm -hmm. Oh, go ahead, please. Uh, what was I going to say? I was just going to say, I agree with that. It was something Jason said I wanted to speak back to. Oh, just, just in terms of um, validation for people who have experienced something outside of the realms of what they're telling us is normal. I mean, I agree with what Richard's saying, but you can't leave these people thinking they're crazy on the other end like if they can't give it all there i think there could be a way to disclose some things or just not to sure. uh when these things happen to people they can become untethered because of these things mm. especially yeah. when they become so isolated and they're constantly told in every direction no it didn't happen well i'm trying to argue i wasn't trying to argue oh, for I know. The secrecy just, oh i know no, no, no. I, I know i know i just wanted to all, just make mention of this mm -hmm. on behalf of experiencers who are you know spending their lives in isolation trying to internally reconcile something and society goes against it but also a lot of the people who reject it and have not had those experiences <clears throat> reinforce society's position to them, you know, mm -hmm. and, and make it kind of worse. Right. Yeah. So, absolutely. yeah. So all I'm trying to do is just uh, leave that wedge open for, there's got to be some middle ground, I think, where we can give some type of help or acknowledgement to the experiencer. And also, I just want to say that um, the baselines of trauma for experiencers are exactly the same of the baselines for trauma markers for, you know, people who uh, have PTSD um, from the war, from rape, from hor horrific things. They, they actual have this, trauma. Yeah. They have actual trauma where the memory is processed in a different part of the brain. Um, just as it is with any other type of trauma versus regular memories. So, I mean, so. So abductees and other people with extraordinary encounter experiences, you're saying, are and are processing their trauma in the same way exactly. that other people process their trauma. Yeah, so. Right. Regardless of what anybody thinks about what actually happened to them, to them, it is as if this really happened in yeah. every literal sense. Yeah. Yeah, so what? We're just going to, you know leave them behind, you know, so I, I just, I just like to point that out, yeah. you know, in advocating for the experience that it, and just the, I guess the experience that these people are going through, um, Absolutely. which I can, which I can relate to. Yeah. It's got to be. Yeah. Lots you of them, can. Right? Yeah. 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 And we, we were actually talking to Sydney mm -hmm. Morrison, who is running the Yale uh, student UFO studies uh, oh. And we're, we're, we're trying to connect, uh, Michael and her are going to connect. We're going to really try to hook her up. Um, cause she's trying to push this in Yale as much as possible, oh, wow. but and, she's an experience. And also from a mental health perspective too, there's like a mental health dimension to her concern about yeah. people's experiences of the phenomena. And Jason and I both have, um, a, a passion for, you know, mental health struggles and how that interacts with people's experience of even normal everyday reality is difficult for a lot of people. For me, that, I'm one of those people. Yeah. Um, so encountering something that's truly bizarre has to be even so much more but stable. It, the, for so the, many but the evidence is also in their lives. Like uh, they, they lose their marriages, they lose their kids, yes. they lose their houses. Like, why are we not factoring that in mm -hmm. into the whole of what that person is saying? It's not just their story. Watch what happened after their story. Watch yeah. the decline of the person or the changes in the person that should be documented. And we're not doing that. Uh, again, we're like, you got, you know, somebody was mentioning the cherry picking of what we want. Yeah. And it's true. I do that too. I work on the abduction and cow mutilations. I love those. I don't know why statistic, <laughs> maybe I don't know. Uh, 
but I, I love those two subjects the most. And but I have to look at everything, and I have to factor in everything. And what are the effects? And the abductees that I've spoken to, I'm like, I asked them, like, well, what was it like? Uh, a lot of people from the '70s are coming forward now, saying, hey, in the '70s, you know, '77, '78. Huge abduction period in the States, it looks like. That's uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. I have a guest. Uh, we have a guest, Susan Alway, Brazil, is coming yeah, on. 77 flat from Brazil. Exactly. Um, and, and yeah, Colaris, uh, that's Brazil's uh, northeastern uh, uh, coastline there. Lots of activity. Uh, that was a huge, huge year. Some people at the time tried to blame that on uh, the release of Steven Spielberg's movie, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, which came out at the later part of 1977. But um, I think there's been a lot of work on this, and uh, I strongly have to disagree with that assessment. Well, when you look at um, uh, the number of UFO sightings, not just abduction or ex uh, direct experiences, but sightings were off the charts. Uh, we're talking military, civilian, uh, and then encounters with beings themselves. Um, yeah, many, many people, many people in 1978 particularly. Tracy, maybe you can speak to this. I'm, one thing that, that continuously unnerves me as I learn more and more about this subject is how people will report having a very detailed, clear encounter with something bizarre, and the standard dismissal of it is just something like, the brain is weird, it does weird things. You saw Steven Spielberg's movie, and then there was a rash of sightings. But that's appealing to, uh, there is no mechanism that I know of that's been proposed in psychology by which people see films and then start having really intense hallucinations like entire yeah. nations of people do. So it's not like there's, you know, if even if that were true, we'd yeah. be positing something really bizarre. That is this bizarre psychological mechanism that causes people to just like lose their minds and really like, uh, you know, narrowly constructed ways after seeing a, a movie or something. Mm -hmm. I mean, is that does that ring true with your understanding of psychology that or my annoyance at least does that ring true for no you? no i mean i think it, it's very logical that some of these things could influence us but no i don't think they can go to that level of saying the culture is creating this the abduction phenomenon like no way that's um i think that's ridiculous and they just don't want to look at it because they don't understand it you know also well, I'm thinking of the movie Jaws. So I was I was a kid when that came out, um, and it was a that was another Spielberg movie, mm -hmm. and it was a terrifying movie. Bum, 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 bum. And it did frighten people away from the beaches. Like Jaws, the movie did have this effect. Yeah. So people were influenced by the movie, but the thing is, you did not see a, an uptick in people saying, "Oh my God, I saw a shark in the water." Like that did. Mm -hmm. I'm not aware of anything like mm -hmm. that. So. There was a fear, uh, but it did not translate into some kind of hallucinatory effect. Yeah, so to, that would which would speak to perhaps your arguments, both of you. Yeah, like I, I still think it's important in my lectures. I talk about people doing honest self assessments, you know, mm -hmm. of their own psychology if they are, uh, you know, having experiences. And I, I do think. The work that Gary Nolan's doing right now, where he's looking at the spectrum of, you know, he's very curious. And I, I love this. <clears throat> he's asking really amazing questions. He's looking more at the spectrum of um, autism and where that might go off in its extreme form. And the other, the sort of the other end of the spectrum with um, uh, like schizophrenia, multiple personality disorder, and that the extreme of that might be fantasy. Because, I mean, we we do have to kind of look at the whole spectrum here, and he wants to look and see if there's indicators in the brain and what we can learn, because it, that that is a holistic look at it as well. I mean, there's looking at the brain with this whole spectrum and then and then talking to people with their experience of the whole spectrum and putting this whole thing together. And then culture, of course, can influence in a certain way, like Richard was just saying. But, and I guess this does call for, again, a holistic look at everything. But um, I do think that people could start uh, to answer your question, I do think people could start dreaming. They could be influenced if they watched Ancient Aliens and the whole thing was on grays. Could they have a dream about grays? I do think they could. 
Um, but I do think there's different sort of markers that researchers know about to kind from all of the patterns to kind of weed out some things. Um, mm -hmm. Weed out some a little bit of. I mean, let's just be real. There's a little bit of attention seeker, you know, the, on on the whole gamut here, because this field is becoming so popular. There really is an. A, there are some people that are attention seeking, um, yeah. but yeah. Uh, you know, it just Dan is. Romanek, I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, and there's and yeah, there's some good. people who are a little bit unstable, right? Yeah. That they just. Um, these these are real things that happen to people. It's not judgment at all. Um, and so there is a, a spectrum and, and we just need to look at all of it and put it together. But mm. I, like, I think where I was going with that was we can tell patterns that are emerging of, um, I don't want to exclude people when I say this, but um, because of what I said in the beginning about deleting the outliers, but there are patterns emerging that we can sort of, um, glean information and we could tell a little bit easier if someone was maybe having a dream that was just, right. um, based off of an ancient alien show that they had. Wrong that interpretation sure. of, yes. uh, you know, yeah. A state of mind maybe. Right. Yeah. I think there's ways to tell this, but is there sort of a mechanism that we can look at? I don't think so. A long way to get our best judgment in many cases. Yeah, it's yeah. It true. So well, I, I didn't have a great answer for your question. I'm sorry. That was kind of all. No, I mean, I think you spoke to the, the complexity of the, of mm -hmm. the situation. There's so many enormous variables, entire cultures and worldviews and like people's, you know, dream lives and the, the depth of human psychology is it just can't be plumbed. So like you, uh, we throw all those things together and there probably isn't a clear answer to um, to questions about how this this phenomena exactly manifests at enormous scale. So thanks for speaking sensitively to it. I just want to add one thing. Thank you for that. Um, Anthony Peake was at our conference and uh, mm. he did a lecture and a workshop he is fascinating. So he looks at this kind of in a different way, uh, more like Jacques Vallée, but he's he's going off in his own direction. And, and I think his uh, ideas need to be considered. He is looking at this as an uh, one phenomenon and that the phenomenon is intelligent and that it will manifest for that person. We should clarify. So when he says okay. he's looking at this, what I think you mean is, Paranormal, sci phenomena, yes, aliens, UFOs, all of these all these different things. Yes. Uh, where I it, there is a tendency for him to do that. But by the way, I don't agree with that. Um, I <laughs> don't agree just, with him on that. But. I'm not I'm not saying one way uh, or the other. I just yeah. think it's an important thing for us to have a look at. Yeah, he but has... there, there's an argument to be made. Of, uh, I was thinking of this recently. So you have a lot of folks who will look at this phenomenon as interdimensional. You have other folks who look at it as extraterrestrial. So for many, many years, I was almost exclusively an extraterrestrial hypothesis guy. I still am predominantly that, to be honest. However, uh, each side has its own biases. So the interdimensionalists, and let's say Anthony's one of those, there's a tendency that they will bring in all of the all of the experiences and say, well, this is interdimensional. Um, I say, well, you know, I look at a lot of these technological cases. I'm, I'm doing a, a very long study a book on uh, USOs right now. So water-based UFO phenomenon. And, and I ask myself, so if an object exits the water and shuts down a United States aircraft carrier for 30 minutes, everything, is that interdimensional? Depends that sounds how, technological. Depends how we're defining interdimensional there. Yeah. But anyway, what I would say is uh, I don't think it's all strictly interdimensional. I think we're dealing with technology. We're dealing with physicality and so on. Uh, so I think that's it's flawed. But on the other hand, the ET people would look at some of the interdimensional types of evidences and just say, I don't accept that. And they would just push it out. So they wouldn't bring it all in. They would just uh, just ignore, ignore, right. which I, I used to do. And so what I, I've come to feel and, that, and Anthony's he's very brilliant. It's true. Um, I I think actually there's probably both of these are true. I think we're dealing uh, with an extraterrestrial or some kind of physical non-human component. Uh, at the same time, they're, you know, 
space is weird, time is weird, uh, reality is weird, there very likely can be existences out of what we consider this dimension as well. So I'm open to that. And I tend to think that when people have, you know, if you're experiencing a ghost, maybe that's what it is. Maybe it's not an ET. Maybe they're not all related. Mm -hmm. He thinks that they are. I'm still on the fence with that, I think. Well, I have different opinions. I had this idea one time. Remember when I used to talk to you about beta isolation? Yes. So this idea is based on the brain the brainwave states. So uh, beta being the one that that we're probably in speaking. Active people thinking. who are listening would be in a little, little bit slower state of alpha, and it goes down to theta for deep meditation, and delta is sleep, and gamma. That's a whole other thing of it could go on and on about but um i i once wondered because this is just the electrical system of the brain but we're perceiving everything through the mind right through the brain and i just wondered why is it that absolutely everything like ideas inspiration flow state hypnosis mediumship any discipline, any side discipline, um, even abductions are usually reported when people are driving, when they're dropping down into a state, right? Like a slower state. Beta being this really awake state. Why is it that every single thing that possibly happens, just about, it would seem, is when, and is when we're out of beta? Mm. So I, I started to wonder since this is all perceived through the brain, is it possible that that brain state is holding us just like, just barely holding us into place where we don't perceive all of these <laughs> things that are somehow together? Like, I'm not trying to categorize them all as the same. They could all be different. But for some way, for some reason, we're designed in this kind of beta isolation. I mean, yeah, it's like a set of blinders that blocks lots of different kinds of things, but you, it doesn't mean that they're all the they're same. They're beta blockers. Like yeah, beta blockers. <laughs> and, yeah, right. And could it even explain, maybe, I mean, this, people will probably think this is very oversimplified, but could it even explain why in a crowd, some people would see things and some people won't right beside Good them? Good point. Good point. Could they For be sure. in a slower sort of oscillating um, electrical state in their mind? So, I, I mean, I've been thinking about this for years. Um, the the thing about the brain waves is they're usually a whole bunch going on at the same time, but there's mm -hmm. a dominant one, right? So beta is really like the awake awake for us. Although gamma is a whole mystery too. I don't know whether to bring that That's into another rabbit discussion. Hole. But um You can see this is why I like hanging out with this. Lady. <laughs> yeah, this is great. You know, this <laughs> makes me think of the work of Ian McGilchrist, who works on like brain lateralization stuff. Um, he has this fantastic book called uh, The Master and His Emissary, where he argues that not only brain waves, but uh have have this controlling um sort of role to play in our in our mental states, but that the hemispheres attend to the world in very different ways so that they're both always engaged it's not like one's doing language and one's doing math or whatever they're both doing both but they do it in very very different ways and that most of our what we perceive as our unconscious modes is this sort of um highly um active left hemispheric mode that likes to chop the world up into lots of different uh mm -hmm. you know objects that we can manipulate and it's what it's also what a lot of meditators in the Eastern tradition would call the monkey mind, which I think is, is probably yeah, also I kind of a big phrase that Tracy uses a lot. Yeah. 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 It's the, Hopefully it's the not against you, Richard. Book. That'd be a low blow. <laughs> Don't ever use it against your spouse. <laughs> <laughs> it's not well, necessarily bad, but, but, yeah. but yeah, but that's, I'm just, I'm just throwing those. Oh, no, no. You're, you're talking about my total passion here. This yeah. the left right brain stuff and all of the experimental studies where they cut the corpus callosum and they look at the differences of how the right brain and the left brain work. You've got are, two people inside you almost if you, you cut have the two people yeah, inside you. Yeah, so it's fascinating. I've uh, myself and other people, Anthony Peake's one of those people, but lots of different people. We wonder if, bless you, if if the uh, right brain is the antenna. You know, remote viewing uh, wonders this. You know, they were looking at this way back when. Well, um, 
And the and it also brings up, sorry, Jason, I, I just want to say this last thing. It also brings up a question of when we have these dreams about abductions, let's just say, we are getting the interpretation from the left. Uh, so mm -hmm. is it even interpreting closely what what's actually happening? Because in remote viewing Or is viewing it just studies, applying familiar sort of tropes or something, right? Yeah, is that the idea right. that it's just kind yeah. of... Because yeah. like remote viewing studies, early remote viewing studies are perfect for this because they realized early on at Stanford Research Institute that the pictures were accurate, but the words were wrong. When they would do remote viewing. When they would do remote viewing. And so they mm -hmm. wondered, is this a right brain function? What? Because th this hand doesn't, uh, like it's getting it perfect, but the words are all messed up. And, the, you know, so... Yeah. Even they were, I think, were taken by this interesting uh, part of it. So um, and the connection I, there is that the right brain has no voice. It can understand right? language, but yeah. it doesn't express using language, it expresses using I imagery and, and other sort of, well, I mean, non-linguistic forms. So it's, it's kind of hard to draw the, the distinction between what's a language and what's not, but it doesn't use spoken language in the same way. So that's a, that's a, a fantastic Thought. I, I love that connection. So, also, the remote viewing connection now sews back into the Soviet interest that you have, Richard, right? Because that's yeah. uh, a whole, you know, backdoor uh, uh, handshake that the Americans and the Soviets had going on with that line of research at the same time. This is fantastic. Funny, last weekend, we <clears throat> we were hanging out with Dale Graff, who, as I mentioned, is 89 years old. Dale worked at Foreign Technology Division at wright Pat back in the 70s, <clears throat> Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, and he is the guy who wrote a uh, the probably the most detailed analysis of Soviet psy psychic research, which was what got uh, the Pentagon in the mid seventies to do its own version of remote viewing for the next twenty years, which Dale ran. Uh, What's he, that analysis? What's his? Is it a book or is it just a, a report? It's a report, and it's more than a hundred pages long. Uh, we have a copy of it. Uh, I'm sure it's. I don't know if it's out there or not, but after the program, I'm. I'm sure we can forward so. it to you. I would uh, love that. We'll put it in the he, show notes for readers. It's yeah, he did this on his own initiative at the at the risk of his career. I mean, yeah. he just you know, he's an intelligence officer and he's looking at the Soviets and he just decided, I want to look at their psychic research. Like, yeah, that's a great career idea. Isn't it? <laughs> and but he did it and um it was such an excellent study that it did prompt the Pentagon to go forward with uh their own version of remote viewing, mm -hmm. Project Stargate, which he named. He came up with that name. Oh, oh, I was, no. was going to mention, guys, too, uh, amongst the experiencers or in abductees, they all seem to be right brain, like you know, artistic, very open minded, uh, compassionate, love animals. I have yet to see a psychopath or a sociopath say that they've been abducted. I've not heard of, them, of one yet, um, but they're all compassionate people. And it's almost like, are they selected or is it that? specific type of person that they're interested in that is a great observation and question and i know grant cameron was is very into this as well right right uh, and he and i first met we just went crazy on the right left brain we were all about it you know right and uh so yeah um people wonder that are are they selected uh people who are right brain dominant or um could it be that maybe it's everybody but the memories are harder to control in more right brain dominant people who are visual spatial. Mm -hmm. I call this just for fun, the messy bedroom brain, because I am off on the right uh, spectrum. Um, I had to draw pictures to learn a lot of things when I was growing up. I, I'm very high on that level. I had to learn how to work it in a left brain world, you know? So I speak for myself when I say this, but and where I get this from, the idea that uh, my memories never feel linear, unlike Richard's, mm -hmm. never. Right. They're spread out all over the place like a messy bedroom. But only mm -hmm. I can know exactly where those things are. And I just wonder if it's harder to manipulate this type of memory organization in someone who's very dominantly visual spatial. It's got to be. As opposed to Good one point. that's very filed and linear, you you would think that that would be easier to control. I, I think it has to be. I would so you think the person dismisses opposite. it too, right? The What's person that? would dismiss oh, well, it. might be, yeah. Yeah, if you're yeah, left yeah, brain, but... you would dismiss it because it doesn't make logical sense 
to the way your brain works. But if you're open-minded, right brain, you're like, oh, that happened, right? Like it. Yeah, you could be open-minded. The memories could be uh, closer to the surface. They could be harder to control. So I have a feeling it probably happens across the scale. But for some reason, people with the that are more dominantly on this side can either remember or, you know, that's just my theory. That's, I don't know. My, my, gut, my initial gut reaction was that it would be more difficult to manipulate the memories of a person who has this really rigid structure for how all the memories relate to each other and you know, organized because you'd be sort of fighting against their filing system. Whereas I'm a messy bedroom person too, but it's, uh, I read this paper probably two years ago that studied artists who uh, and how they organize their spaces. And there's like two very distinct ways. There are people who have cabinets for absolutely everything. And yeah. then there's people who have to be able to see all of their tools at the yeah. same time to be able to think. And that's oh, it's terrible. Me. Yeah, it's, that's you too? Yeah, but yeah, oh, absolutely. Like I, but I realized what I'm doing is I'm not a fundamentally messy person. It's just, I'm using my space like it's all one gigantic shelf. Me too. So I can see where everything hit. I, to I totally get it. But and, and I need to be able to do that to think creatively. Like, what am I, what, you know, materials am I going to grab for this project or whatever? It's, it's all filed away. I can't even, it's like I have no object. It's like it's, it's gone like, forever, it's, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's are like, you, a, are you a million tabs guy too? I got a million tabs. Because I oh, got to remember great, all my thoughts. I got to remember all I have a great extension for you for, for the browser that will just take all of your tabs and put them in a neat, neat, neat list that you can. We're, we're going to be best friends. This is great. This is great. <laughs> yeah. I love I this. To, uh, I love this. In my more mean moments, I would sometimes poke fun at all the tabs that Tracy has open on her computer. He still does. I mean, it's <laughs> uh, around the edges a little bit. There. But hey, I embrace but this about myself more now. You, you like your tabs. It's <laughs> fine it's, it's worked for you just go with it you're not crazy it's yeah. just, but, but if you lived in nature nature is one gigantic shelf there are no drawers out right in in, in yeah. nature yeah. so like yeah. we evolved to live in a world that doesn't have the hasn't chopped everything up into nice little pieces that Absolutely. we can kind of stow away and manipulate Absolutely. so there's a, there's an advantage to it though i mean the advantage to get it diminishes the more we live in this sort of left brain world but I'm, i agree I'm, i agree I'm, but I'm, jason it was a great question Oh wow! Well, I don't that's, know. That's, I don't know yeah. the answer, but I, yeah. I really think that's a great question. Well, even we're talking about question. the the dumbing down almost of the uh, you know the beta state, and the thing is, Joe Rogan recently uh, was talking on his podcast about he thinks it only happens at night when people are sleeping or they're sleepy behind the wheel. And I beg to differ because this yeah. happens in broad daylight right. and you're fully awake. But everybody yeah. says there's like a, a dumbing down of their state of mind where yeah. they're just compliant and it, it's the way I could only understand is that in 2017, I was in a bad car accident. Uh, I was taking a sip of coffee, put my coffee down and we got hit. Now I felt everything, but my brain visually did not keep up with the feeling of what was happening. It was mm. sending it to me in chopping mm. blocks. I remember the accident. I remember certain scenes, but a lot of it is not computed because the, I think maybe the left brain kicks in at that point. Um, and that's all you can remember. And I think, you know, maybe these experiences are so traumatic that it's similar to a car crash. They mm -hmm. see the clips the same way the brain did for me in the accident. Mm -hmm. uh, even though their physicality, something went far beyond those clips. Um, mm -hmm. So I think maybe part of the experience or the phenomenon is something like that. And it's frustrating because we can't reproduce it. Like a mm -hmm. scientific experiment, you could reproduce the conditions with these buggers you can't and it's frustrating and i think we we have a very hard uh field to study because yeah. there's a trick react uh, uh, you know a trickster aspect to it and just Absolutely. before we we leave what what are your thoughts on that uh the trickster element in our reality um well I've, i'll just back up a little bit and uh and describe what i think reality is these days i believe that uh, we are dealing with a um, an actual physical group of beings that come from some other place that have a very strong interest in our world and in us as a species. Uh, and I think at the same time that there is uh, what I sometimes call a meta intelligence or something that is operating above us in a way that's just vastly beyond any kind of human or alien intelligence that I can think of. I, I actually think both of these exist. So you can call that a spiritual dimension, uh, what ancient people would have called a spiritual dimension, what we can now call, oh no, 
uh, they live in some other kind of dimensionality. Maybe maybe quantum physics can factor its way in there somehow. I don't know. Like the source, right? The source. There's some. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. Um, I tend to believe in. Um, uh, I guess I could say I believe in God, uh, as uh, however I can understand what that is, uh, a kind of pervading intelligence that uh, is all around us, a field, a field. Mm. And I, I think that that field is of uh, an intelligence level that I can't even comprehend. So I think that's there. Um, so the trickster part of it, though, I mean, there have been a number of, of uh, instances where UFO researchers have done detailed studies of, of this phenomenon going back many decades. Um, there was a guy back in the early eighties named, um, God, um, Harlan Smith, something like that. Project identification was his, uh, his book. He was a professor at, uh, in Missouri who, uh, took his grad students. He was a skeptic on UFOs and they did outdoor studies of UFOs. And he quickly came to realize that this phenomenon was, anticipating him it was prescient it was vastly beyond it seemed to be playing games with them you hear people like uh dr eric davis say this exact same thing about uh the phenomenon that it's prescient that it, it it's messing with us at times you know eric davis was over at the skinwalker ranch for years so he had a really good deep dive into that whole phenomenon so th there could be a real trickster uh element to our reality the thing is, I don't think we we we've only as a species graduated to a certain level of awareness of our world. Um, and so we're now finding ourselves encountering maybe extraterrestrials and maybe interdimensionals as well. And do we really know the full landscape of both of those worlds? Uh, do we know how the interactions are between and among those different groups? Uh, not really. Do we do it's like going to a ball game and you don't have the scorecard of the teams? We don't really know all the players yet. And so we need to do a lot more research and figure that out. But to answer the question about a trickster, yeah, I, I would not be surprised at all. You hear about a hitchhiker effect, mm -hmm. uh, people coming back from Skinwalker Ranch being followed by some kind of phenomena. Maybe that's partly a trickster. And I don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. I would just say that I think that there are genuine mysteries to this reality that we find ourselves in, both it, in the physical realm, dealing with UFOs and ETs, as well as a, a dimensional realm, dealing with what we might call a spirit world or things like that. A lot we don't know. Here, here. Nicely said. Nicely said. Tracy. <laughs> uh, I just, you know, I just couldn't agree more. I mean, we do our best to figure it out, but we just really don't know. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the most difficult things for me when I see a lot of people out there claiming that they know in an absolute way. And I thought, how, how could we possibly know? I mean, yeah. this is, we're doing our best, but there's just so many aspects to account for. Um, it is mm -hmm. virtually impossible to come to a solid absolutist well, you know, in this um, day and age, for sure. About <laughs> it. I mean, yeah. So I would like to add one thing, which is uh, um, when I look at the, the physical UFO, UA, <clears throat> UAP phenomenon, um, leaving out the interdimensional, leaving out the trickster part of it, the actual physical interactions that people are having with what appear to be craft, uh, which happens a lot. Uh, it's hap it happens all around the world every day, every day. There are good uh, reports, cases. Yes, they can be raw reports, not fully investigated, I understand. But when you read enough of them, as I've done, I've read thousands and thousands of them, uh, you start to think these, there's a real pattern here. And um, I, I think you can develop a sense uh, of, of the reality and the, and the legitimacy too. When you do that, uh, it becomes clear that there's something very, very important going on in this world mm. that is important to those beings doing this. They've invested a lot of their time or their energy or their equivalent of money or whatever it is to blanket our world right now over the oceans, over the mountains, over the cities, over your neighborhood at 2.30 in the morning at altitudes of 200 feet, hanging out, doing God knows what. Why? What is happening that's so important for them? Are they abducting people? If so, why? And what are they doing? Are they having any, are there any other plans? And I'm not even saying that it's necessarily nefarious, but it could it be? Could it be 
for our interests or could it be against our interests as a species? Could be either. Or could it be well-meaning? Um, well, well-meaning. Um, you know, like. Yeah. It could be. All of these, but mm -hmm. this is what, this is such a, to me, such a massive phenomenon that even now in an era where our media is discussing this more and more, we're not, we are really at the baby steps level of conversation publicly on really discussing the implications and the importance and potential, potential gravity of what's happening. Think of it this way. We're in a world that's right now in the middle of a of genuine revolution. No one calls it that, but it's a revolution. It's a, it's a centrally directed, I would call it a global, let's call it a globalist revolution. That's real. Uh, yeah. You have international coordination of politicians, of corporate financial institutions, of, of ideas, of uh, consistency of propaganda, state-sponsored propaganda over the people, all of that. We all see it. We went through it with COVID and, and it hasn't ended. I live um, in Canada. I live it. So, that's right. Yeah. We watch your government horrifically destroy those truckers. Yeah. Uh, that's that's an unforgivable crime against against uh citizens. Absolutely. But but, but that's one aspect of of this greater thing. And I, I'm bringing it up for this reason. The the world is going through a massive social, technological, intellectual, political, financial, workplace revolution where you know people are losing jobs, all of that. Um, we're transforming into a post-human, transhumanist, whatever the hell this is going to become. At the same time that this presumably non-human intelligence blankets our globe, is there a relationship? Should we be asking, mm. do these other beings have an opinion on what we're going through? I mean, we've uh, existed as a species, I mean, literally, for more than a million, I mean, as standing up apes without body hair, one to two million years, developing language, all of that, like we've been human for a while. We've lived in a certain way. Now we've developed civilization, writing, technology, yeah. But the transformation we're going through now, there's nothing, nothing like this that we've ever gone through. And, and it's rapid and it's dramatic and we need to understand this. And at the same time, these others are here. And, I can't help but think, are we on the trajectory to become like them? Hive mind, singular consciousness, uh, and maybe all the other things that go along with it. That might be a good thing, or that may not be something that I want to sign on for. But I'd be willing to listen important. to <laughs> I'm all ears. We tried it our way. It doesn't work, right? <laughs> yeah. It does not work. I'd, I'm maybe all ears. Yeah. 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 Maybe, maybe not. Yeah. That, that, but but the point is, this is the discussion that our society must have. Right. I'll yeah, you brought that. some really good points there, Richard. Um, and, and that's the point that we're at right now. It's it's very confusing. We're almost on the edge of war. Canada's, it, it, you know, it, it, we're fighting here for our rights. Uh, in the states, there's it's almost on the border of civil war. Um, it, it's bad, and globally now everybody's trying to pick a fight. Like it's like a everybody's drunk at the bar. Everybody's trying to pick a fight, and it's not looking good. And in the meantime, we're trying to fight for advocacy of of them saying, hey, tell us that we have visitors. Yeah. And uh, it's hard. It's a very hard time. But the fact that you guys, like even I know today you guys got three interviews, but the fact that you guys are so consistent and tenacious enough to keep at this, uh, my hat's off to you because I would have given up years ago. I, like I was telling Michael, I'm like, uh, we were on a phone call before this. And I said, you know, they, they got three interviews today. I'm like, I need my time. I'll do two interviews, but after that, I need to read. I need to chill. These guys are like, nah. We love what we do. Going. Yeah, yeah. We, we love it, it. It helps that there's two of us because we really, throughout the day, we keep each other going with this. Because that's good. This yeah. has been the craziest, busiest January we have ever had. Yeah. It, yeah. you know, where things are stacked like good. this. That's good. That means momentum. Glad we could be part of right? it. Thank you yeah. for taking true. the time for that. That's so true. Thank leave. you guys too. Yeah, before we leave, I always have a, a sort of final question that I ask, and that is, uh, what books would you recommend to our audience to help them understand the phenomena or the, the area that you work on in the way that you do, the things that will sort of be the most explosive books that you could push into someone's hands? Well, uh, I'll just jump in. I, I feel like I wrote such a book. <laughs> uh, it was it. my intention. Uh, for, for someone who is, uh, let's say, a reasonably uh, open-minded, skeptical kind of person relating to UFOs. 
um, I would say I wrote I wrote a book called UFOs for the 21st Century Mind, exactly for that kind of a person. Mm -hmm. uh, it was my attempt to do a kind of one one stop shopping, everything. What's important about the UFO subject that you need to know? Uh, so in that book, I I dealt with philosophical and scientific issues. I dealt with the historical uh, development of the UFO subject. I developed uh, developed delved into the development of ufology, how we've come to understand this over time. Uh, I've looked into the the, the crazy science that's actually not so crazy when you get into it of how these objects might do what they do. And I tried looking at the future. So, uh, and then dealing with, you know, contact, abduction and contact and th things like this. I tried to, to look at it all in a way that um, is uh, not intimidating for a new person, but but deals with a lot of media issues. So I would say, read, read my book, UFOs for the 21st Century Mind. Uh, it's a good place to start. A lot of other great UFO books that have been written. Uh, many, many great ones. And uh, Above Top Secret by Tim Good was the one that got me going. That's a book yeah. that was written in the 80s. That's a very fine book. And there's many others. <clears throat> I would say, yeah, it's it's interesting because we all are interested mm -hmm. in slightly different aspects that interest mm -hmm. us, right? And uh, so one of my sort of, I mean, there's so many different books. And I probably, my highest interest is in the abduction area. But even beyond that, and what my lectures are about, what everything I believe in is about, is uh, uh, is learning to explore our own minds and what we are capable of. I, I feel like we've we all have the truncated version, yet we yet we have these odd premonitions or precognitions or synchronicities or deja vus. We have all these little clues, these little breadcrumbs around, but we don't know who we really are and what our brains are capable of. And so when people are exploring uh, remote viewing, if, if they're interested in the mind, this is me, um, there's many different books you can go to, but I'll just say, I'm going to answer this a little differently. The one that I'm really into right now is actually one of Dale Graff's books. Mm. Um I, I love the remote viewing books. I love the abduction books. But the thing about that I've learned about Dale Graff since we have spent some time with him now is if you are on the personal journey of opening up your mind and exploring and wanting to know how to gently push the boundaries, this is Dale's whole world. So which I, is the book you're yeah, referring to? Well, there's two. He's got, they're out of print, but they're still out there. <laughs> uh, one of them is called River Dreams. And one, this is the other one. Um, Bring that closer. Uh, psychic Tracks in the Wilderness. Tracks in the Psychic Wilderness. So this is nice. one. Okay. River Dreams is his favorite. I'm kind of digging into both of them at the same time. Because that's part of our right brain messy bedroom thing, right? I got both of them yeah. going on and <laughs> multiple books at once. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Post it notes. You can't just read one book at once. What's the point? Yeah, exactly. Two hands, two hands. Yeah. But but I love it that Dale was a part of this program, running this project for all these years. Yet beyond that, he is it. He it's a river dreams. Is he is his approach is like an approach to nature. Uh, he's it's like the inner tracks he's looking for the inner tracks of the mm -hmm. psychic realms he's following the trails he's such a pioneer in that way and so in his books he has these beautiful ways of encouraging people to explore their own minds and find their own psychic tracks you know find the breadcrumbs if the, it seems like there's nothing there and we have you know you could explore mediumship or psychometry or this or that Dale's kind of opening up a gentler, um, natural way to claim this back and find out things you didn't even think of that you can do. Mm. So that's my take on it. Um, so I love that suggestion. I mean, and what could the UFO UAP community use more than a gentler sort of uh, an emotionally mature? approach to to these interests uh, I, I love that suggestion thank you so much yeah you're nice. welcome it's always awesome uh to talk uh old richard is the second time and his first time for you tracy but seriously the dolans are always welcome here on this podcast and anything we can do to help you guys out promote anything uh we will by the way do you guys i we just had an event that this weekend but do you have anything else coming up that you want to promote um not at the moment um 
I think down the road, like every now and then, these little online conferences we do, we're, we're starting to get the rhythm of it. So they're working out pretty nicely. Uh, I will definitely be hosting one or possibly two this year. Uh, I definitely want to do one on on uh, UAP crash retrievals. Nice. Mm-hmm. I've got a number of folks that I will want to invite for that, um, and we can do a deep dive into that phenomenon, which I'm very very engaged in. So uh, we'll we'll see, but I'm I'm sure. Right now, look, my main thing is I've I've got a, a big big book to finish on a water based UFO phenomena, USOs, and it's, percentage uh, wise, how close are you to being done? Oh, we're in the high ninety percentiles nice you're almost there yeah uh, i've got more than 500 cases i believe um and there's more that i can include but i you know you have to you have to end it at some point so that's been uh the last two years and it's been beyond fascinating it's in the realm of mind-blowing uh the cases i've come up with um they've been scattered all over the place like uh, a couple of websites here a couple of books there they haven't really been gathered together and and they haven't been in my view, systematically analyzed and and described and sort of told in a way that brings them back to life. And that's really what I'm trying to do. So Which that's is, my biggest thing. It's brilliant too, because uh, it needs to be addressed and there's not enough people addressing it. Plus, we call this planet Earth when it's mostly water. It goes to show how stupid we are. Seventy-one percent right? of our surface is water, and you know, but we're all land lovers. We live on land most of the time. Yeah. And- uh, and we're not aware, but there's, uh, and it's not like there's a tremendous number of recorded USO cases compared with aerial, normal aerial phenomena. It's, it's, it's a small subset, but it is an important, fascinating subset. But and that's also got to be due to our technology and the amount of sensors that we have that are, you know, air-based as opposed to underwater. So I'm sure that the, and, and the ones that are, the ones that are underwater are often us Navy and very duly classified. Mm. So the information doesn't come out. So, uh, that's a big part of the problem too. I mean, most people are not out there in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, but the U.S. Navy is, but they classify the information they get. And, and the big rivers as well, right? I, I mean, Buddy rivers, Hawkins had that case where that lady yeah. gets taken and then it goes into the river. Uh, Calvin Parker and Charlie Six and went into the river. Oh, yeah. uh, so they yeah. do that. They, they just, they use the waterways. That's a great rivers, way not to be seen. Reservoirs, lakes, absolutely. And oceans. And uh, that's right. Large That's scary. Small bodies of water. That is scary how much probably activity takes place right now as we're speaking. We, yeah, we right? were talking about in BC and Tracy mentioned Kelowna, the town. I have a number of cases from Kelowna, BC, British Columbia. Yeah. Uh, I forget the name of the river they have out there, but it's uh anyway, there's there's a lot. British Columbia has got uh, quite Very a bit. I mean spot. there's infinite little bodies of water and lakes in Canada. Yeah. Uh and so there's a lot of a lot of cases up there. Yeah, and interestingly, it's the same almost uh, for uh, American viewers and people from across the world. Uh, the Kelowna area is very similar landscape to that of the Nevada range of mountains. Mm. It leaks into True. British Columbia. So it's it's a desert. We have rattlesnakes in that region. So it's very interesting that there's a lot of activity there, too. In my region, uh, Fraser Valley, we have uh, black triangles and a lot of them. And uh, they're seen five right. at a time in Surrey yep. to, to Hope. Um, you probably heard about that already, Tracy. Lots of black triangles as well. there, yeah. Totally. Yeah. yeah. And Washington State too. So I'm guessing the Cascade Mountains have something to do with it. I don't know There's why, long, but. Longstanding connection uh, speculation about Boeing because they have their Seattle headquarters oh, there. And there were a number of black triangle cases connected with uh, Boeing Field back in the early 90s. I'm aware of. Um but there's there's stuff that's been seen coming out of the water out by you know Vancouver Island and that whole region. It's freaky. Uh, there's a lot going on out there. Yeah, there's, there's a lot a of famous Navy activity. Too. Yeah, you got U.S. and Canadian Navy, so you have to factor that in too. But a lot of strange things happening out there.